go to the Lord in prayer. Holy God, we come to you this morning, and we thank you for the opportunity to worship you as a congregation, to come together in this place. God, we thank you for the sunshine outside. We thank you uh, for a week that was uh, a little bit warmer this week. We thank you for the chance to gather together in fellowship. And we invite you into this place that we might worship you this morning, O oh God, through all the aspects of worship. God, we lift up the prayer request we have mentioned to you this morning. We ask that you bring healing and comfort, that you will be, bring hope in challenging situations, that you will steady the hands of surgeons and give wisdom to doctors and nurses, strength to all those that need strength. God, we also ask that we might be of help and aid wherever we can, that we will continue to be your people and bring encouragement in your presence to each situation. God, as we come to worship this morning, we ask your forgiveness for all of the ways and the times we have not been like you. And in receiving that forgiveness, God, <clears throat> we also ask for your strength that you will help us each and every day to be more like you, to be your hands and feet in this world wherever we go, that we will bring your presence with us to each and every place, to each and every moment. And Lord, we continue to pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. this morning is singing a song that uh, we hope to teach the church. Uh, it's called Living Hope and it's written by Phil Wickham and I want to read you a little bit about what he wrote about what this song means. God has rescued us from a place that we could never have rescued ourselves. Our future was death but Jesus came in and brought life, a living hope into our souls and lives. As we begin learning this song this morning, I hope that the deep meaning and um, expressions of this song will resonate with our hearts as we think about what Christ has done for us. This morning, we would invite you to, to listen and to learn. We're going to sing it again next week and invite you to sing with us. But if you know this song, you're welcome to sing it with us, Living Hope. Great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your way. Through the dark. 
darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory.
I hope that we'll be able to sing it for Easter. That's our goal is for us. We're going to sing it several times prior to Easter and then to be able to celebrate together with you knowing it well and to be able to sing it for Easter. At this time, I want to invite our children to come down and for you to stand with me and uh, greet one another and then continue our singing with, Oh, That Will Be Glory. Just to be near the dear Lord I adore Will through the ages be glory for me Oh, that will be glory for me Glory for me, glory for me When by His grace I shall look on His face thought about the number of things that we could flip if we wanted to. Now, I was going to show you my back flip this morning, but um, Dr. Kaba wouldn't let me. So maybe another time in Sunday school, um, I'll show you my back flip, okay? But we'll hold off on that. So back to flipping. Lots of things we can flip. Later today, we're going to see a coin being flipped, right? in the Super Bowl, if you're ready for the Super Bowl or not, it's okay. But I could flip this coin, right, to see what's heads or what's tails. Uh, We can flip pancakes. We could flip grilled cheese sandwiches. We can flip a burger, right? You know, we can flip our bodies. Uh, We can flip them backwards or forward. Uh, We can flip letters in a word. Have you ever misspelled a letter because you flipped a, a letter? that was supposed to be somewhere else, I have. We can also flip houses. You ever flipped a house? Yeah. That just means you buy a house that's really kind of messed up and needs some work. So you redo it, and then you turn around and you resell it. It's called flipping a house. Lots of things we could flip. Well, in today's scripture that you're going to hear in just a few minutes, it's being read by Miss Emily, Jesus' words kind of sounds like he's got them flipped, like, He's really kind of messed up. They sound really strange, even kind of confusing. So if you'll listen, I wonder if you'll think the same as I in that they're flipped. But guess what? They're not flipped. Jesus knew exactly what he was saying to the people then as well as to us today. You see, when Jesus came as a king, he wasn't born like most people expected, right? He was born in a stable. He didn't grow up like a king. He didn't travel around like a king. He didn't dress like a king. But he came to be the king of the world. He was just a little different. And people thought, no, there's no way. This can't be the king of the world that we've been waiting on. But he was. You see, they were expecting something different. But Jesus gave us the kind of king that we needed. And so the words that you hear today are exactly the way they're supposed to be. And as you hear Dr. Cobbin talk about them, I hope you'll remember that when our worlds may be flipped upside down a little bit because of COVID or because something else that's going on in our world that you just think, why is this happening? Just remember, 
God can take care of whatever it is that's flipped upside down in our lives. That's why he came, was to love each and every person and to make sure that everyone knew he wanted to be king of their life and that no matter what was going on in our lives, he was right there for us, with us every step of the way. So I hope you'll listen today and figure out in your own head, is Jesus really saying what I think he's saying? Or is he all flipped around? Let's pray. Thank you, God, for these boys and girls who listen so intently. Father, thank you that their little brains are working, even if they're not quite understanding exactly what Miss Susan says. Father, continue to work in their lives and in their hearts. Father, they know that you want to be their best friend and king of their life so that when things seem flipped upside down in our lives, you are right there with us and you understand everything we're going to. Father, give us the grace and the strength to follow your words because they are what's best for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Great worship songs as you are my all in all, and uh, you may remain seated as we sing. You are my strength when I am weak. You're the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus. Please stand for the reading of the word. Um, today's scripture is from the Gospel of St. Luke. When they came down from the mountain, the disciples stood with Jesus on a large level area, surrounded by many of his followers and by the crowds. They were people from all over Judea and from Jerusalem and from as far north as the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those troubled by evil spirits were healed. Everyone tried to touch him because healing power went out from him and he healed everyone. Then Jesus turned to his disciples and said, God blesses you who are poor for the kingdom of God is yours. God blesses you who are hungry now 
for you will be satisfied. God blesses you who weep now, for in due time you will laugh. What blessings await you when people hate you and exclude you and mock you and curse you as evil because you follow the Son of Man? When that happens, be happy. Yes, leap for joy. For a great reward awaits you in heaven, and remember, their ancestors treated the ancient prophets that same way. What sorrow awaits you who are rich? For you have your only happiness now. What sorrow awaits you who are fat and prosperous now? For a time of awful hunger awaits you. What sorrow awaits you who laugh now? For your laughing will turn to mourning and sorrow. What sorrow awaits you who are praised by the crowds? For their ancestors also praised the false prophets. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may, re you may remain standing. Ah. I'll invite our deacons now to come to receive this morning's offering. Our deacons are our faithful response to God's love and mercy in our lives. Deacon Pat Rhodes comes to ask God's blessing. Pray with me, please. Father, for all we have, for all that you've done for us and for all that you've given us, we are truly grateful. We ask that we would take these gifts, Lord, and use them in the most suitable way that we would get the best return for your investment. Please help someone today realize the joy of giving for the first time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
spectacular, beautiful Sunday morning. I'm going to take a pastor's prerogative moment and just say that there are amazing days coming ahead for us. We are moving back toward Wednesday night programs slowly. The choir starts back this Sunday, this Wednesday night, and just preschool child care for choir members. 
But then on March 23rd, our Wednesday night program goes back in full force. Children's choirs, missions, adult Bible study. And that night, there is a children and youth camp fundraiser spaghetti dinner. You can hear Emily and Susan applauding back there. Wednesday night, March 23rd, we're going to sell you overpriced spaghetti. <laughs> yes, you can make it a whole lot cheaper at home, but we're trying to get our kiddos to camp. We've got five te children and five teenagers going to camp this summer, and we need to help them pay for it. The following Saturday, that's on Wednesday, the following Saturday in here is a missions carnival raising money for Habitat for Humanity and Extreme Build. So la that last week of March, Wednesday and Saturday are going to be big days. And then Sunday, April the 3rd is our day back, our first day back in the sanctuary. So April, March and April are going to be very exciting. Put them on your calendar. You'll be hearing a lot more uh, about these events in the days ahead. Our text is coming out of the Gospel of Luke. Jesus has been up on the mountain where he has called his 12 apostles. The word apostle means messenger, literally postal worker. Tim is in the Bible right here. Apostle, the word postal comes from the word apostle, one who is sent with a message. And Jesus comes down from the mountain with his 12 and other disciples, the text seems to say, and waiting for him is a large group of people on a flat place, on the plane, not on the Boeing 747, but on a flat place. <coughs> and he gives a sermon very, very similar to what the Gospel of Matthew says he gives up on the mountain. So now we've got two sermons. The Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain, and they look awfully similar. As Jim Hunter rightly pointed out in Sunday school, when you got a good sermon, you stick with it. There's an old, there's an old story about a, the preacher who preached the same sermon every week, and finally the deacons confronted him, why do you do that? He says, well, once you start doing what I'm telling you to do, then we'll move on to the next thing. <laughs> So Jesus is telling this story over and over, and it's a very familiar passage in the Luke's, in the Matthew version. Matthew's Sermon on the Mount is 111 verses, but Luke does it in just 29 verses. Matthew's version is more spiritual. Blessed are the poor in spirit. But Luke's is more about relationships. It's practical. It's personal. Probably not two different sermons, but one sermon preached in multiple locations. Does the name R.G. Lee mean anything to some of you? If you've been around Southern Baptist life, you know the name R.G. Lee. He had his famous sermon, Payday Someday. And he was famous. He would go all over the world. Pre people would stack up to hear R.G. Lee preach his famous sermon. That's how they did it in the old days. In Luke... The Beatitudes start with this word, congratulations. Congratulations are you who are poor. Congratulations, you who are hungry. Congratulations, you who are crying. Congratulations when you are hated. What could be more counter to our way of thinking and living? These aren't blessings, these are curses. Hobby Lobby would go broke selling plaques that said, I'm blessed to be poor and hungry. Nobody's going to buy that. Nobody makes those and puts them on their walls. Because poverty and hunger and sadness and hatred means suffering and misery. And then Jesus goes the next step. How sad for you who are rich. How sad for you that are well fed. How sad for you that are laughing. How sad for you that you're loved by everyone. It makes a little more sense to us in Matthew's version. We like Matthew's version better. Congratulations when you are poor in spirit. Oh, okay, now I, I can rhyme with that. Congratulations 
when you hunger for righteousness, oh, I am hungry for righteousness. Congratulations when you are hated for doing the right thing. Oh, yeah, I like to be a martyr. It feels better. It's not what we expect. It's what we expect to hear. Matthew's version is what we expect to hear. But now we have this version in Luke. Luke's emphasis is on everyday kinds of problems. Hunger, loneliness, poverty, sadness. These people dealt with this every day of their lives. Luke's gospel telling shows that God cares enough about our everyday problems to enter into our lives with us, whatever our lives are holding. And when, and when that happens, we recognize our utter dependence on our Creator. When you are hungry and poor and alone and hated, you don't have resources and you must depend on God. People who are poor and hungry, who are sad and despised, are people who know about their utter dependence on God. Here's the bottom line. When you are in need, you realize how utterly dependent on God you are. But I got to tell you, it's not a club I want to join, right? I like Matthew's version because it makes more sense. On the front of your bulletin, I asked June to put a picture of an upside-down world because that's what we're talking about here. This, these words of Jesus on the plane are the upside-down world of the gospel. Our thinking is if you have food on the table, you are blessed. If you have a home and a job, you are blessed. If you have many friends and are well-liked, you are blessed. That's what we say, and that's what we put on our walls. Grateful, thankful, blessed, right? But Jesus says if you're hungry, you're blessed. If you're poor, you're blessed. If people hate you, you're blessed. I, I want to put this text into the world that Jesus inhabited. Poverty, hunger, sadness, and religious hatred were daily threats for these folks. Though the poor and powerless Jews were the ethnic minority or majority in the country, the Romans and their cooperative Jewish counterparts were running the place. The regular people, the vast majority of the people, were totally powerless over their own lives. The best hope you could have was that you could steer clear of any Roman soldiers or powerful Jews. For them, they knew nothing of hunger and poverty. But for the everyday people, people just like us living in Palestine 2,000 years ago, hunger and poverty were everyday experiences. I think I want to just chase a little short, a little tiny rabbit to say that what Jesus is giving us here is description, not prescription. Jesus doesn't say, blessed are you make your, when you make yourself sad. Blessed are you when you make yourself poor. Blessed are you when you make yourself hungry. That would be a prescription. What Jesus is saying is, in where you are, in your despair, God knows you and sees you and God cares about you. In your need, you find a dependence on a God who hears and who cares. The rich and powerful have what they need in their cupboards already. But you are totally dependent on your Father in heaven. I have a pattern 
to my week. Every Monday I work from home and I, I spend time with the text. And my goal is by early afternoon to at least have a first draft written. By early afternoon, by 5 o'clock staff time, it was still sitting there. Some weeks you really wrestle with the text. And what I came to was this part of the text, blessed are you who weep. I have not spoken publicly about the great sadness in our family's life. And I want to do that. On October 17th, our 26-day-year-old grandson died suddenly from a congenital heart defect that we were told was surgically correctable. On Sunday evening, about 6 p.m. on October 17th, on the side of the Gene Snyder Expressway right in front of the Ford plant, a dark shadow came over our hearts as baby Theo slipped away from us. I know many of you can relate to this pain. You don't know how many people have experienced the death of a child until you go through it. And I've been surprised how many of you personally or in your close family have had this common experience. Standing in the hallway of the Norton Children's Emergency Department watching this gifted team, 12 or 15 people, medical personnel, trying to pump life into this lifeless baby. Without a doubt, was the worst experience of my life. For an hour, we prayed and cried out for God to save this baby. I've never said this publicly. But it won't surprise you, because I think you've done it, that I pled with God to take my life and let Theo live. I've experienced life. I've had great things. Let this child live. The days that followed were hell on earth. Making plans at a funeral home and picking out burial clothes. A church family paid for the, for the burial outfit for baby Theo. Going to the cemetery and buying a cemetery plot for a, for a 26-day-old baby. Trying to boost up these heartbroken young parents while keeping your own head above water. Waking up every morning hoping it was a dream and you didn't have to face another day. It seemed there was no end of weeping. Blessed are you who weep? We didn't feel blessed. Most of you know that our son is named Bennett and his wife is Megan. And Bennett, of course, grew up in this church. One of Bennett's best friends ever, ever from childhood on, in fact, because we were in church together with Pat and Cindy prior to here, Bennett and Campbell have known each other every day of their lives. Well, Campbell's a year older, every day of Bennett's life. Campbell and Sierra were married in Cleveland, Ohio in early October, and Bennett and Megan couldn't go because baby Theo had just been born. But when Campbell and Sierra heard on October 17 that Bennett and Megan had lost their baby, they called into work and got in their car and drove six hours here from Cleveland. And they came to our house. And on the night after Theo died, the four young adults, Bennett and Megan and Campbell and Sierra, sat around our dining room table and played Monopoly. And for just a little while, our kids sat in the redemptive company of this young couple of dear friends who loved them and cared for them enough to drive. Campbell and Sierra were willing to enter into the numbness and the trauma of that day, and they didn't shy away. Blessed are you who weep. For you will laugh. The next day, Campbell and Sierra came back again. 
before they drove back to Cleveland, and the following weekend they drove down again. And they didn't fix anything. They just came and sat and watched TV and did whatever Bennett and Megan wanted to do. Our kids stayed with us two weeks before they went home to face an empty baby's room. And every day and night for those two weeks, a steady stream of young adults. Friends from high school and work and church came and they came and sat and watched TV. and They talked and every now and then they'd laugh about something. Older adults, many of you, came carrying casseroles and cakes and cookies through our door. All of you hugged. Some of you sat and watched TV or had a cup of coffee. But all of you carried the grace of God and the love of Jesus to us. And every day we saw the very best of humanity expressing kindness. I can't say enough about Cody at, at um, the funeral home. Can't remember the name of it. Newcomer. And th the lady who runs the cemetery out at um, Floydsburg. And the coroner who took the baby from the hospital, but who called the kids within just two days earlier to say, You did nothing wrong. This baby died of. Something uncontrollable. The Anchorage Middletown Fire Department, who stood, 12 of them at the hospital, stood outside in a circle for hours and hours. Um, the two shop owners of a little children's store in Norton Commons, uh, where the kids bought the outfit to bury him in, that, that owner gave them the little cap to put on him. The deacons and many of you opened your hands and your wallets to help pay for funeral expenses and the lost work, and we will never, ever forget you. Blessed are you who weep, for you will laugh. This week, this weekend, Bennett and Megan announced they are expecting baby number two. They waited until the ultrasound showed a viable pregnancy. Everything looks good. We're listening for that heartbeat, you know, and they said it sounds like a freight train. That's what you like. And in the new sanctuary renovation, in the front foyer, there's going to be a rocking chair for fussy babies and a little bookcase with some of Theo's little books to distract the children who've had enough of this boring preacher. We are all, we are, our, our whole family, we're holding our breaths and praying like crazy for a healthy baby. But I want you to see that we are living proof that God has come to us in our weeping and brought laughter back into our home. I've thought about some possible names. Cornelius Cobbin. Corn cobbin for short. <laughs> it's not real popular with the family. We've looked at that, um, <laughs> that little picture, you know, they get you of the ultrasound, and it looks like a bean. But I'm sure somebody's going to find little arms and legs. And Sad times will come again. For all of us. We will have days of weeping. But now we also remember what laughter sounds like. None of us wants to be poor or hungry or sad or despised. But those experiences are sometimes unavoidable. And when they come, they aren't the last word. Poverty 
and hunger and sadness are not writing your story. Because your story is in the hands of a loving Heavenly Father who sees you and knows you and comes to you in your poverty and in your sadness and in your loneliness and in your hunger. And by learning that lesson, we can say, when I am in need, I am blessed. Pray with me. Lord, these words of Jesus are frightening. Because none of us want to be in that position. But all of us will be at some point. And so, O oh Lord, we come to declare our utter dependence on you that when we are in need, when we suffer, we find you and we find what we need. Hear our prayers for ourselves and for each other. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we join together in singing, My Faith Looks Up to Thee? Be seated, please. Our moderator.